Okay, hello. Um, sorry, it took me a second to get all that put together. Oh, and wait, let me turn off this light. Okay, that's better. Um, all right, so uh, as I said at the end last time, I'm gonna start by saying something about innate principles because I didn't really get to that last time. Um, this probably means that I won't get to talk till about abstraction until next time, <laughs> but we'll see how far I get. Um, all right, so um, innate principles. Um, so again, as I was saying at the end yesterday, um, what would an innate principle be? Um, it doesn't only mean something like innately known proposition. I mean, it does mean that, but it means something more than that. It has to be a kind of proposition that is uh, suitable to serve as a principle. Um, where, as I said, you know, you could say as a first principle, but actually principle already means first. Ray, like princeps in Latin means first. Um, so, uh, yeah, a first principle, something f on the basis of which we could we could build our knowledge, right? Because that's it's that's why it's supposed to be a competitor to empiricism. Instead of building 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 our knowledge on experience, we're going to build it on these principles. Um. So that's why um, those faint ideas of warmth and pain and whatever that babies might be born with um, are not going to be suitable to formulate theoretical principles, right? Because the, the first principles of knowledge are not going to be about hunger and pain and whatever. At least Locke assumes they're not and his opponents assume they're not, right? They, they assume that the first principles of knowledge will be these very general abstract would be these very general abstract truths like it is impossible for the same thing both to be and not to be. Um, and this is also why an innate idea to be effective would have to be perfectly clear. Right? Like if there was a first principle, but it was somehow not clear what the principle meant, then it wouldn't be suitable as the foundation for knowledge. Right, and so that's that's the basis for another kind of line of attack that that Locke um, pursues against the innate principles opponent, which is that um, that these ideas like God and identity. Which are would which appear in some of these you know uh, proposed first principles or innate principles um, are you know uh, forget whether we're born with them even now people don't really agree what those ideas are um, right so many people have all kinds of very strange ideas about God as Locke says like that God is a big man with a white beard sitting on a chair in the sky, right? Um, uh, and similarly, uh, well, actually, it's a little bit different case, the case of identity, right? So here, I, identity, and it's always going to mean this in this course, it means sameness, right? Like identicalness. Um, I, I, I always have to emphasize that because, of course, nowadays we use identity mostly I mean, it's the same word. I guess we use it. Well, is this a derivation? Anyway, like we use it to mean like a group that I identify with or something like that. 
I consider it to be, you know, essential to making me the same as what I am, or I don't know. But anyway, the point is, when Locke is talking about identity, he just means the principle, the the idea of sameness, of being the same, right? As it appears in that proposition, it is impossible for the same thing both to be and not to be, right? So Locke says, in this case, people have all kinds of, like, people, I don't know, maybe it's not that different. In this case, people have all kinds of weird ideas. In this case, these, you know, people have a hard time deciding whether something's a case of identity or not. Um, right? Like um if there's reincarnation and Pythagoras and some other guy have the same soul but in different bodies, is that the same man or is it two different men? So he says, look, I mean, uh, uh, people scratch their heads over that question. Uh, Locke's going to give an answer eventually. Uh, that is the answer that's appropriate for the time when we ask the question or something like that. But he's saying it's clearly not innate. Any principle involving identity because... Uh, you know, adults are still trying to figure out what they mean by identity. <laughs> um, and again, like a principle on which we base all our knowledge can't contain, uh, the point of it would be so everyone would know the same things, right? But if like it contains these unclear ideas, then um, it wouldn't be usable. And when he talks about practical principles, Right. So remember, the innate principles, some of them are speculative, that is theoretical, and some of them are practical. That is, I could, Locke doesn't think there are any, right? Locke thinks there are no innate principles, but some of the innate principles his opponents are proposing are theoretical or speculative principles and others are practical principles. So the theoretical principles are the ones we could base our knowledge on. The practical principles would be the ones we can base our uh, actions on. Um, and uh, um, when he gets to practical principles, he, you know, he deals with someone who tries to say, well, we all know these practical principles, but um, um, but we don't necessarily act on them. So, um, and he says, well, that defeats the purpose of having practical principles. The point of practical principles would be to act on them. <laughs> So if everyone's born with these principles, but it doesn't make you act on the principles, then uh, like, again, it's not fit to serve the purpose of innate practical principles. Um, so, um, so that's the the purpose that principles are supposed to so, uh, serve is like one basis on which um, Locke attacks these proponents of innate principles. He's you know from a, a very various different angles. He shows that whatever things were born knowing, they couldn't serve that purpose. Um, another line of attack or or response to a possible defense on the part of the innate principles people. So um, well, maybe I'm putting the wrong thing first. Another line of attack is based on Locke's understanding of what it would mean for a principle to be innate. I guess you could say I've just been talking about what it would take for it to be a principle, right? It has to be fit to serve certain purposes, either to found all our knowledge or to direct all our actions. 
Um, but another question is what could be meant by innate? So, um, Locke says, um, it has to mean that we actually know them. Now you might say, well, of course it means they actually know them. We're born knowing them, right? That's what innate, princi innate principles means. We're born knowing them. But, um, but if you think that sounds reasonable, Locke says you're not taking it literally enough. Um, it doesn't mean that you're bo born able to know them. Because he says, um, we're born able to know anything that we ever will know. And we're born able to know lots of things that we will never know. Right? That is, we have that capability or faculty of knowledge. So Locke doesn't deny that we have innate faculties or capabilities. Of course, we have that. Right? But he says, you know, um, that pertains no more to it is impossible for the same thing to be and not to be than to I'm looking at a pen. Right. I mean, those are both things that I'm capable of knowing. Um, everything that I ever know, obviously, was something I was capable of knowing. Otherwise, how could I know it? Right? So um, and, it, and if you say, well, when did I become capable of knowing it? Well, like as soon as I existed, I was in some way capable of knowing it. Right. That is capable by means of a certain process of coming to know it. A longer or shorter process. So Locke says that for innate principles to, for there to be something special about them, it can't be that we're born capable of knowing them because that applies to everything. So what else could it be? Well, there could be other answers actually, but, uh, but he doesn't consider any other answers. And he says that he certainly discusses the other obvious answer, which is, it doesn't mean we're born capable of knowing them. It means we're born actually knowing them. Um, oh, hold on one second. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Um, so uh, it means we're born actually knowing them. And um, therefore, the, um, the argument for innate principles must appeal to um, universal assent, where assent is like um, something positive, right? It doesn't mean just like um, um, not thinking they're false. It means everyone who's born with this principle must be born believing that it's true, being certain that it's true, in fact. So they all have like thought it. And as I said last time, it's not clear exactly when. I mean, uh, they it doesn't, I think, doesn't mean that they have to have thought it continuously. I used to actually think he meant this, but I'm pretty sure he doesn't. It doesn't mean that they have to have thought it continuously from the time they were born until now. But I guess it means they must have thought it right when they were born. <laughs> Right, because any other time they think of it, they have to remember it as something they already knew. 
So they had to like have positively assented to it at the instant they were born, something like that. Um, it's uh, pretty far fetched, and of course, that's exactly what Locke goes on to point out. Uh, um, you know, uh, now I mean, it's clear that his opponents didn't mean this. He knows his opponents didn't mean this, but he he thinks he you know. He knows they really meant something like you're born capable of knowing it. You'll know it as soon as you reach a certain age. You'll know it as soon as you're asked or something like that. But he says none of those um, uh, show it to be innate. Um, so I, I guess I should have said, so um, in order for innate principles to be innate, we have to assent to them. We have to have already, already, always already assented to them from the time we're born. And we should mean everyone. Now, what does everyone mean? Um, so, uh, at, at this point, um, well, okay, let me first say what Locke says it means according to his opponents and then discuss why, um, that might be appropriate. So what he says it means, according to his opponents, is all human beings, or actually he says all men, but um, is it time to, I haven't talked about it in this course yet, I think, about the use of men <laughs> and of uh, gender exclusive pronouns, you know, like he and so forth. Um, I think I haven't talked about that. This uh, everything is a blur, but I think I haven't talked about that yet. Uh, this quarter, so um, it's uh, at least not in this course, it's um. So like when Locke says men in a case like this, he is not usually intending to exclude women. That is, I think, like if you asked him, oh, does this mean men and not women? He would say, no, of course not. And he would say, and you know, men can mean that which it could, <laughs> um, maybe can't anymore, but it certainly could. However, um, on the other hand, if you didn't ask him, it's probably true he's thinking of men and not women. Right, that is, that's the idea that's associated with that word in his mind, which according to Locke himself is a very important point. <laughs> Um, so, uh, um, and I mean, I think it's because the, this, this word has always been, has always had a double edged nature to it in English. Um, it always could mean human beings in general or men and not women. And, and in fact, I think we'll see one place where Locke actually uses that like kind of switches from one meeting to the other in the middle of a sentence. <laughs> um, um, so, you know, therefore what to do about it. I mean, when I talk, I'm going to try to say human beings and not men, but I, I don't, you can't just go through Locke's text and correct it <laughs> because it, it is double-edged. Sometimes he does mean men and not women. Um, so, um, and it's important to notice that. 
sometimes it's really important to notice that sometimes that's part of the point in Locke and in other authors um so uh um that is sometimes it's not only is it sometimes that they intend it to mean men and not women but sometimes that ambiguity of it is part of the point um so uh so i'm not going to apologize for it every time he does it i think you know it 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 really is something that was dangerous and tricky about the way that word was used and we can't like make it go away by uh, wishing it wasn't there. <laughs> so we just have to deal with it when it turns up. All right. That was just a um, digression, I guess. Now back to what Locke is actually saying. So Locke says that universal means all human beings. All human beings must assent to them already. Um, what does all human beings mean? Well, we'll see later on that according to Locke, usually when we talk about human beings, or as he says, men, we mean um, basically animals that have a certain shape. I mean, he's going to use examples of thought experiments and whatever to prove that, right? Like, for example, if you met a rational parrot, you wouldn't say that's a human being with feathers. You would say it's rational like a human being, but it's a parrot. <laughs> what was the definition of a sense in this context? Someone is asking in the chat. So, um, um, I was saying it means, you know, like positively believing in it so you've you've thought it and been certain about it in the past and when you need to you can like call that back that certainty back from your memory um so it's like explicit assent although not explicit in the sense that you have to have said it before right but in the sense that you have to have thought it before So, right, so what we're saying here is that if these principles are innate, then all animals, like all featherless bipeds with toenails or, you know, whatever you think this definition, how this definition of human will go, but it's basically about the shape. Um, uh, is, uh, right, like all of those things have to assent to this principle. And then Locke's going to say, but it's uh, that's clearly not the case. They don't all assent to this principle. For example, infants don't assent to this principle because they don't understand it. Um, what he calls um, idiots or sometimes changelings. This is this, I think, for him is a kind of clinical sounding word. And now, of course, as tends to happen with these words, it's, it's become derogatory. This is a euphemism. Um, it means like cognitively dis cognitively disabled people, severely cognitively disabled people is the ones he's talking about. The ones who, you know, have never shown the ability to understand a proposition like this perhaps have never shown any sign of rationality at all. So he says they don't assent to it. And he says, actually, probably a lot of grown, you know, cognitively able people also don't assent to it because they've also never thought about it. <laughs> um, but certainly the uh, infants and idiots haven't assented to it. And so there's no universal assent. Now, I mean, the question is, uh, well, I mean, so we'll see that when Locke talks about the definition of human being, he says that we usually use it to mean creatures of a certain shape, this shape, 
you know, roughly. <laughs> so, um, but then he's going to, he goes to great length to explain why, therefore, it's not a morally relevant concept. Um, right? Like, it's not the shape that matters. It's, for example, whether you're able to uh, agree to a social contract or not. That's what's going to matter, um, whether you're able to understand the moral law or not. Um, it doesn't matter if you're shaped like that or if you're shaped like a parrot or whatever. At least as I understand it, that's what Locke, that's Locke, going to be Locke's position. So, um, so why, like, why would Locke think that, in other words, why not think that these principles are innate to some human beings and not to others? Well, I guess, I mean, the infants one kind of causes trouble there, <laughs> right? Like, everyone's an infant first. Um, uh, um, but maybe you could say the same thing about those infants that sort of, so to speak, they're not born yet in this as full fledged human beings. Um, but anyway, like certainly this example uh, is, um, um, Locke is not denying that these people are human beings, but the question is why not think since they they differ from uh, other human beings in their ability to have knowledge in general, why not think they also, also differ in what innate principles they have? Um, so I, I mean, I think therefore, I think this objection is based on his opponent's premises. Um, like uh, his opponent's um, have no other like when they say these innate principles they're they're innate and so they're like natural to us they belong to our nature when they when they say that they um um the us there whose nature they belong to they have no classification available for it except the species classification. <laughs> they can't say those of us who are rational enough to figure them out because they don't think we figure them out. They think we're born with them. <laughs> <clears throat> so that's the best way I can understand how that attack is supposed to work. I, I'm, not I'm, I'm not sure I have Locke right on that <clears throat> um um but uh i mean all i can say is the this reliance on human beings as a natural con in other words like why not why is it an object why isn't it an objection that cats don't assent to these principles because cats aren't human beings they have a different shape um, but why does that matter, right? Like, why draw the line there? And uh, you know, I, 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 um, I, I don't think, based on everything we see about concepts of substances and the definition of human and so forth later in Locke, I don't think Locke means to rely on that being the obvious line. Where the where the ascent should stop. So I mean, I may not have the exact reason correct, but I but I think the argument is according to you, innate principles, people, all human beings would have to ascend to them, and they don't. Um. So there's a lot more to say about innate principles. Um, and I could try to explain better what I just said about them. But uh, since I need to get onto the new material, I'm not gonna say anything else except um, um, one thing, which is that 
uh, when Locke goes on in chapter four of book one, um, or chapter three, if you have one of those editions, <laughs> um, but at the end of book one, Locke goes on to uh, to attack the view that there are practical principles. Um, he says, and in that case, there's even less universal assent. Right, like at least in the case of these theoretical principles, if you really explain it to someone and they understand it, then at that point they will assent to it. Like it's impossible for the same thing both to be and not to be. Some philosophers are an exception to that, but uh, maybe not any Locke, Locke knows of. <laughs> anyway, um, but in the case of practical principles, Locke says, people like who've thought about it and paid attention really disagree. There's no practical principle that everyone agrees on. Whatever is thought to be a good action in some place will be thought to be a bad action somewhere else. Um, so... Uh, um, I won't say more about the details of that now, but um, I will talk about that more later when we get to the part of the essay where Locke describes the basis of his own moral views, um, like uh, what he uses that argument for um, in a positive way. All right. Are there any questions before I go on to the new material? Okay. Um, not very many people here, so I guess I can't expect very many questions. Although, <laughs> maybe not. Maybe I will get a lot of questions. Um, all right. Um, so I'm going to start talking about the new material by talking about mechanism. I mean, I guess I should say there's really two main topics I want to get to today. One is mechanism slash primary and secondary qualities. As you'll see, these are these two are basically the same topic. And the other is abstraction. Um, these are both super important, and Locke, you know, his main discussion of both of them is in this same reading. Um, so you know, it often happens and may well happen today that I don't get to this one in this lecture and I have or, or get to only the beginning of it and have to treat it in more detail next time. Um, so I'm hoping to get to both of these, but I'm going to start with this one. It comes first. <laughs> um, okay, so um, and to start talking about mechanism, I'm going to start talking about what a body is. Right. And here we body is intended in the in the broadest sense. Right. It doesn't mean like a human body or something like that. It means anything that is extended. That takes up space. So like the air in this room is a body. It's not a solid body, but it's a body. Um, um, so in order to be an extended thing, or as Locke will say, using more precise terminology, an extended substance, something that, that has this predicate of extension, a thing that can be just cor correctly described as extended, that's what a body is. Um, right, that is, the body isn't the extension itself, it's the thing that is extended. <laughs> and so anything like that must have certain properties. 
first of all, it must have a size. Or as Locke often says, bulk. Right? He's using that to mean, I guess, what we would call volume, three dimensional size. <laughs> um, it has to, it has, it, if it occupies space, it has to occupy a certain amount of space. Second of all, it must have a shape. Or what Locke usually calls, sometimes he says shape, but sometimes he says figure. Sometimes instead of bulk, he says size. Sometimes he says bigness. <laughs> um, all right, so it must have a shape, at least assuming that it's finite. Um, it gets to, you know, there's like a boundary between the space that it occupies and the space that it doesn't occupy. And um, that boundary has a certain characteristics that we call its shape. And it also has to have a position. Now, um, Locke understands position as relative. So when we say it has a position, we mean it has a position relative to other bodies that are around it. Um, um, right? Like, that is, it takes up a certain amount of space of a certain shape. And we can say which space it is by reference to the other bodies around it, their distance and direction from it. And finally, because it has that relative position, it has to have relative rest or motion, right? That is either that position is changing. So the space it takes up is now this space and now some other space and now some other space, or it's not changing. Again, relative to the other bodies around it. Um, so it's either relatively at rest or it's relatively in motion. So these are all properties that an extended thing as such has to have. And then there's one more, according to Locke, what he calls solidity. Um, and solidity has to do with what it means to take up space. What does it mean to take up some space? Well, it means no other body can be in that space at the same time as it. Right, so body A is taking up exactly the space that other bodies can't be in while A is there. So other bodies, so if A is here in this position now, um, another body B can't move in here unless A moves. As long as A remains where it was, this other body can't go in there. Um, and Locke thinks, so this is the difference between Locke and Descartes, but almost everyone except Descartes is on Locke's side in this difference. Locke thinks that must mean that A um, has a certain power of resisting other bodies coming into its space. Right, so that's a power that the body has. The operation of that power is the actual resistance. Um, as long as this body is floating by itself or is nestled among other bodies that aren't moving with respect to it or whatever, then that power is not being exerted. But as soon as, soon as some body tries to move into its space, then A will resist that. 
And that power of resistance, and Locke says it's absolute, right? Like, this is A's space. It's A's nature to take up this space. Nothing else can be in this space while A is there, period. So this power, it's kind of like infinitely strong, so to speak, right? Like, no matter how hard it pushes, B can't be in A's space. Now, I mean, A can move out of the way. But if as long as A remains there, it absolutely resists any other body being in its space. Right, so if you say, what about a body like a sponge that kind of resists a little bit me getting into its space, but if I push hard enough, I can get into it. So, you know, of course, a sponge does that because it's full of holes. <laughs> and when I press it, some of the air that's in those holes moves out. And that allows some of the sponge to move into the place where the air was. And since the sponge is able to move into the space where the air was, um, the other part of it is able to move over. <laughs> and that's what's happening when I squeeze the sponge. Yes. Aiden. At the uh, time uh, of... I can't oh. hear you. Oh, is my... Uh, can anyone else hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you now. I just had my volume off. All right. Okay. At the time of um, Locke writing about this, how developed was like the like theories of like particles and atomic theory and all that? Where like they knew that like atoms had like we now know that like atoms have mass and like like particles have mass and was that all like a consideration within his work? Well, um, so I'm, you know, I'm basically, I'm on the road to explaining how Locke and other 17th century people thought the, what they thought the physical world was composed of. It's pretty different from what we think. Um, uh, I mean, what we think is really weird. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, like we call them particles, but particle means small part, right? We, so like, it sounds like we're saying that a big solid body, like a sponge or an ice cube or whatever, can be broken up into smaller parts. And those parts are also bodies. And they can be broke up into smaller parts. And those parts are also bodies. And eventually we get to the tiny, tiny bodies, the particles, right? But the truth is that like an electron is not a very small body, whatever it is, <laughs> right? I mean, it just doesn't work that way. Um, so, uh, and yeah, I mean, like that full story on that wasn't understood until the 20th century, like the 1930s, right? <laughs> So Locke doesn't know anything about that, but even, you know, like uh, um, the theory of electricity is still like, um, um, I mean, they knew about electric effects, like static electricity. They had the word electric, <laughs> but they didn't know anything about like, you know, current or magnetic fields or I mean they knew about magnets right so I like the yeah so that basically the answer is like very little <laughs> very little you can't assume very much of our view of like what matter is like on a microscopic scale um oftentimes it doesn't matter but other times it seems to matter a lot so I, I mean I'll, I'll discuss it as we go along um, right, so, I mean, like, as you can tell, according to this, Locke thinks that you will find tiny, solid bodies inside any big body, and however many times you break it down, you'll find smaller, solid bodies. 
and that you know things that are able to squeeze or flow or whatever that's because those very small bodies can change their position relative to each other um um and of course like on a large scale that's true as i said when you when you squeeze the sponge um you're not really compressing the solid matter of the sponge. You're just moving it. <laughs> and the air is moving out of the way to let you do that. Um, and, you know, when the air moves, what happens is that, like, small parts of the air move. <laughs> right? So, I mean, so, like, on a large scale, it's true the fact that on a small scale it's not true again um is like that's one of the things that makes quantum mechanics so incredibly hard to understand <laughs> um right so anyway getting back to Locke. so um so lock says that um uh, to be a body also means to have this property, the property of keeping other things, of resisting other things coming into your space. Um, I guess, you know, I could say one more thing about, this is why I not, end up not getting to the things I want to talk about, but <laughs> I could say one more thing about the, you know, like not that long after Locke, in the, you know, 18th century, people started to um, consider theories according to which when you look, and this is more similar to what we think, although it's still not the same, that when you look on a really small scale, what you would see is not small solid bodies, but like centers of force. So centers of repulsive force, so that, you know, there, there would be no absolute limit that you couldn't get inside. It would just get harder and harder as you get closer to the center, right? Which is kind of like a classical understanding of a point charge. It doesn't have a absolute surface you can get as close to the charge like in other words let's say this is a negative charge and you also have negative charge and you're trying to get closer to it you can get as close as you want but the closer you get the harder it will be <laughs> right so like this is a this is another way of understanding what solidity is that is closer to what we think but that's but that's also in the i mean for example that's what Kant thinks Kant doesn't think that solid bodies are solid on a small scale. But uh, that theory is also in the future compared to Locke. All right. So, um, so Locke says every body must have this power. But then he also adds something else, which is weird and which you're going to have to try to understand which is that this very same power is also the quality that causes a certain simple idea in me. So, like, if I put something solid between my two hands, these are my hands, and I have something solid in here, um, and I try to bring my hands together. So on the one hand, because it has this power of solidity that is of resistance to other things going into its space, I can't bring my hands together. I think that Locke discusses having two hands because when, when Descartes talks about this, um, part of his argument that there is no such force is that, like, if everything always moved away from me when I, whenever I tried to touch it, I would never have this sensation. 
And Locke is like, well, but try putting it between both hands. Now it can't get away. <laughs> but, but in any case, so one of the things it does due to its power of solidity is keep my hands from moving together. But also, like, here's my head. <laughs> At the same time, it also causes me, here's my mind, to perceive this idea, the idea of solidity. And Locke says, um, therefore, at the end of chapter four of book two, that solidity is a simple idea, like white or the taste of a pineapple or whatever. It doesn't have parts. And so um, it can't be defined. Right, an idea that has parts can be defined. I tell you what the parts are. If you ask me, what is a snowball? I say, well, it's something round and white and cold, et cetera. But if the idea is simple, I can't tell you anything about it. What? So if you ask me what it is, what do I do? All I can do is, as Locke puts it, I send you to your senses, right? So like, if you wanna know what white is, I can hold up a white piece of paper and say, this is white. <laughs> Um, so like similarly, Locke says, if someone asks, what is this solidity? I send them to their senses. Try, you know, taking a fully inflated football. I don't know if he means a round football or a football shaped football. <laughs> anyway, um, um, try with a fully inflated football or with, you know, a uh, rock or any other solid body. Try to bring your hands together while it remains between them. And then you'll know what solidity is, right? You'll know because that will cause you to have that idea as the um, immediate object of sensation. And then by way of that, you'll, as usual, be able to refer to the object, to the quality or power of the object. But the weird thing, again, is that this quality of causing this <laughs> idea of solidity also is or necessarily go along, goes along with this quality or power of resisting my hands. Like you, you understand why that's strange? <laughs> it's just, there's, these are two completely different things. One is the power to cause this mental operation. The other is the power to keep my hands from coming together. And Locke is saying that um, um, the same power does both, or the two powers always go together, or something like that. When he says that, is he referring to it as just one thing that has these two different, I guess, powers? Or is he just referring to it as like almost like two different things? Or... Well, it's, okay, so like, depending on what you, you mean by that question, that like, is there a thing that is the power? <laughs> That's gonna be the question of like the reality of the power. Is it a real power? And that's what I'm going to talk about, right? But in terms of like the thing that has the power, the substance, well, yeah, there's just one, right? Like whatever that is, that ball or rock or whatever I'm holding in my hands has these two different powers. I mean, now that itself is not strange, right? Like a snowball has two different powers. It has the power to cause me to, it has the power to look white and it has the power to feel cold, <laughs> right? Um, and uh, the same thing can have both of those powers. Um but in this case, it's not just the same thing, 
but it's that somehow um, these powers can't be separated from each other, right? Like in the case of the snowball, so the snowball is white and cold, but a cotton ball is white and not cold. I mean, unless you cool it down, but anyway, it's not always cold anyway. So, um, um, uh, whereas in this case, what we're saying is that, um, um, you can't have a thing that, doesn't have the power to make my hands stay apart, but does cause me to perceive this sensation of solidity. Um, which is strange. And I'll, I'll, I am strange and important, I think, and I'll get back to that. Um, Right, but I mean, this explains why you can't define solidity, but you can say something about solidity, right? So like, if I asked you, what is solidity? Locke can say, well, you know, just like if you ask what is white, Locke can say, look at this and you'll see the, the color white, right? If you ask what is solidity, he can say, well, do this and you'll feel the sensation of solidity. Um, but he can also say something further about solidity. Um, and this is what he says at the beginning of chapter four of book two. Um, this is on page 124. By the way, I should say I've gotten a couple questions about um um, so you're welcome to use a different edition of this book. I've gotten a couple of questions from people who bought the Hackett edition. And the Hackett edition of this book uh, is abridged. That's that's why I, you know, usually I try to go with Hackett editions because they're always inexpensive and, and you know, reason, and reasonably good. Um, but for this and also Hume's treatise, the Hackett editions are abridged. That's why I ordered the Penguin Classic editions. So, um, you know, if you do have an abridged edition, I, I haven't looked at it. I don't know how clearly marked it is where they did the abridgment. If it's clearly marked, um, then of course you could always just, uh, and you know, assuming that you're diligent and you want to do all the reading, which of course I recommend, <laughs> then you could always fill in the missing sections by looking online, right? Like, like free versions or whatever. Um, if it's not clearly marked, then then it might not be usable for this course. It, it depends which parts they left out, which I don't know. Um, all right, anyway, so getting back to this, um, The idea of solidity we receive by our touch. This is right in here at, at, at chapter four of book two, Locke has, is in the midst of going through a kind of list of different simple ideas in what sense we get them from. So now he's getting to this simple idea, solidity. The idea of solidity we receive by our touch and it arises from the resistance which we find in body to the entrance of any other body into the place it possesses Till it has left it. Right? So that's saying just what I just said. There's this simple idea. We can't define the idea. You have to feel it. But somehow we know something extra about this idea, namely that it arises from the insurmountable force that uh, we find in body to the entrance of any other body, etc. Okay, so that's solidity. And then um, because of solidity, so like, so we know that any body, if a body is defined as an extended substance, we know that every body has the following properties or qualities, it has size, shape, position, 
rest or motion, and solidity. And based just on these properties, we can also understand how one body can act on another. And the way it can act is by what's called impulse, which basically means pushing. Right, since body A and body B can't be in the same space, if body A is moving this direction and it gets to body B, then um, either body A has to stop or body B has to start moving. Or something in between or whatever. But right, like we're not trying to derive the laws of motion here or the laws of collision. It's more fundamental than that. Like we're not saying at this point which one is going to stop and which one is going to move or whatever. But the point is, like, we can see that by moving or uh, towards another body into its space, this body can cause something to happen in this body, or vice versa. That is, um, due, to, due to their solidity, they can affect each other's rest and motion. And that, and that, again, is a way that bodies can affect each other that we can understand just based on what a body is. Right, just like just based on the concept or idea of body, we can see how it is that bodies can affect each other. They can change each other's state of rest and motion by pushing. Okay, and mechanism. I mean, there's different uses of this word, but I think that this is the the strict use of it. Um, Mechanism is the view that these properties, the properties that every body must have, are the only properties that bodies really have. Um, right? Bodies only, and I haven't said what really means yet. <laughs> That's going to be key, right? But the only properties that bodies really have are these properties that all bodies must have. And that is every body has it and its parts, which are also bodies, have these properties and so do their parts, etc. cetera. <laughs> and therefore the only way bodies, the only way bodies can affect each other is by pushing. So like, if it seems, you know, I have this body here and it seems like kind of magically, it has the power of drawing other bodies to it, attracting them. I know that can't really be the story. What must be happening? Well, somehow like particles that I can't see are flowing out of this and getting behind this and pushing it. And um, so what about other properties that we tend to attribute to bodies like the color, taste, smell, sound, I guess, although we don't really think of bodies as having a sound, right? I mean, we think of them as making a sound, but usually people throw it in this list anyway. <laughs> and uh, heat and cold, um, those are properties that are not really in bodies. Where are they? Well, they're really in us. They're in our sensations. And we mistakenly attribute them to bodies. Right, so, so that's mechanism. I mean, it's called mechanism because it means that like everything in the world works the way a machine works, right? A machine with like gears and stuff. 
<laughs> you know, it all works by by solid pieces pushing against each other. Um, and in the 17th century, mechanism is a very, very popular position. It's not just Locke. Um, I mean, it's first of all, Galileo, probably most importantly, but also Descartes um, and uh, um, Hobbes and Um, Spinoza, uh, some other people, it's a little like Leibniz is a mechanist of a kind, but it's a little bit weird. Um, you know, Newton, I guess, says he believes in it or acts like he believes in it, talks like he believes in it, even though his own principle of universal gravitation is very hard to explain mechanistically. <laughs> and not long after Newton, people gave up on doing that. Um, so, but anyway, so so this is a um, very popular position. Um, uh, but um, and what we're seeing here is Locke's version of it. Locke has his own version of it. That is, he has his own version of first of all what it means. Like, what does it mean that the property is really in a body? I probably should also mention Locke's mentor Boyle is another uh, strong adherent of mechanism. So, and uh, like some of Locke's terminology, like primary and secondary qualities and whatever are, um, are, are found before Locke in Boyle. Um, so, uh, right. So what does it mean that these properties are really in the body? What does it mean that these other qualities like white and hot and cold are not really in the body? Um, so like he has his own version of that interpretation of this mechanistic principle, and he has his own uh, justification for it, like explanation for why we should think this is true. Um, okay, I'm just going to stop and ask for questions, but I guess, Aiden, you'll let me know if I have a question, if you have a question. There's no one else here at this point. Ryan had to leave. Um, I do hope people will watch the recording of this. I know that this is a especially like bad time to ask people to to attend a makeup lecture, but I hope some people will get a chance to watch the recording. Um, and if you watch the recording and you have questions, you can email me. <laughs> um, uh, all right, but anyway, so um, so I'm going to go on and explain what Locke's version of mechanism is and what the justification for it is supposed to be. So I think to understand this properly, you have to... Um, go back to something I mentioned briefly in the um, introductory lecture, um, but didn't really get into the details of, which is nominalism and realism. Now, I mean, every year when I lecture about this, I keep trying to find a clearer place to begin and way to understand what the issue is. Um, so this year I'm trying this. <laughs> so just like start, first of all, um, so like, The issue of nominalism versus realism has to do with the different with the ways we denominate things, the ways we give them names. Um, now, of course, not well. I don't know if I should say of course, but not proper names like Fred. <laughs> um, but um, uh, general names that say what kind of thing they are. So, like. One way to denominate something would be from its effects, right? Like, so for example, here's the sun, and one of its effects is to melt wax. So here's this wax that's melting. 
It's melting because of the sun. So since the melting of the wax is an effect of the sun, we can use that to give a name to the sun. We can call the sun um, wax melting. Now, I guess, I mean, I should say in English, we have a pretty strong division between um, what used to be called nouns substantive versus nouns adjective, right? And noun and name are basically the same word. They're both they're both for, they're both descendants of the Latin word nomen. Okay. So um uh you know so maybe it's a little weird to think of wax melting as a name for the sun but you know see, we can sort of say this in English you all you always say this in Greek or Latin uh uh the sun is a wax melting it is the wax melting <laughs> right um in English we tend to we would rather we would rather fill in a kind of dummy dummy noun there right we'll say it's a wax melting thing okay so but however you say it I'm including that under we're including that under names and one of the names we can give the sun is wax melting now um contrast that with if we call the sun straight so here's one name is wax melting but instead let's call the sun bright so now you might think at least we're not just talking about its effects we're talking about what it's actually like Um, I mean, that is, um, one way to, to get at this, I mean, I think it's, this is actually kind of a consequence of it, but one way to get at this and why you would think that is like, if there's no wax here, then the wax meltingness of the sun is nowhere, right? It's not actually wax melting. It's only potentially wax melting. So denominating something from its effect is denominating it based on a, a mere power that it has. But when it's not exerting the power, that is, when there's no operation of the power, there isn't really anything there. Right, so the sun stays the same when I take the wax away as when I bring it back, but the wax melting is only there when I put the wax there. Whereas the sun is would be bright even if nothing else existed. So there's, that is the brightness of the sun is a kind of thing that's there in the sun. It's not a thing, of course, like a little piece of it, like a particle, <laughs> right? But it's, um, um um it's a thing that's really there as long as I say a thing that's really there remember really means thingly <laughs> this has race in it which equals thing um so you know um it's um 
uh, I'm going to say it's part of reality. Well, that's just saying the same thing again. It's a thing. <laughs> yes, Aiden. Is that how you pronounce it, Aiden? Yeah, yeah, okay. it is. <laughs> um, so uh, for like the um the melting, what you're talking about with the melting wax, because yeah. we could sense that the wax was melting, and um then we like uh we like perceived that the the melting wax was like due to the sun's due to exposure from the sun we we attribute that like quality to the sun if i'm using all that correctly yeah but with um like bright or like brightness i suppose that would that be called a real quality of the sun so that's what so like um so what I'm getting at is like at a first pass, as a first pass at this, what you might think is denominating from something from its effects is um, not denominating it based on anything that's in it. Whereas denominating something from its intrinsic properties is denominating it based on the thing that's in it. So again, real equals thing. So yeah, you could say the wax meltingness of the sun is not a thing. The sun is correctly described as wax melting, but not because of a thing that is the wax meltingness of the sun. There is no such thing. There's just the sun. <laughs> and it has certain powers. Um, but powers aren't anything except when they're being exerted, when they're operating. Um, so uh, it has um, certain, I'm denominating it based on a power that it has, but that power is not a thing. As opposed to when I denominate the sun bright, we're thinking, yeah, there is such a thing as the brightness of the sun. Now, like, I don't want to push this too hard because uh, um, neither Locke nor anyone else holds exactly this view that I'm that I'm like trying to, as they say, build up an intuition for. <laughs> um, but again, I'm just I'm like. Uh, just trying to find a way into thinking about things this way. Uh, like um, that as a first pass, this means might seem plausible that when you call something a name based merely on its effects, you're, um, you're not calling it that name based on a thing that's in it. Whereas when you call it some, a name based on its properties, you're calling it based on a thing that's in it. So it's real, right? So that's that's why like the difference is between nominalism and realism. It's nominalism and realism about the um, uh, denominative that's derived from this, right? So like brightness versus wax meltingness. Brightness, we're saying, is itself the name of a thing, right? So we call the sun bright because there's a thing that is the brightness of the sun. And this is called realism about brightness, right? We, realism about brightness is to say that brightness is real. That is, that it's a race, that it's a thing. As opposed to here, if we're nominalists about wax meltingness, we say, Again, of course, it's true to say that the sun is wax melting. <laughs> we're not denying that, but we're denying that wax meltingness is the name of anything. Rather, it's a pure name, as the nominalists say. 
All right. So 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 the distinction is supposed to be kind of like this. Now, but then if you if you buy this, you might start worrying that maybe some of the things that you thought were um um you thought were properties are actually just powers. Yes. So if we were talking about like coffee, like hot coffee, there would be the heat or the heat of the coffee would be a real thing because it's hot coffee. Yeah, but now, but yeah. The sweetness or the bitterness of it would not be, or we would deny, um, we would deny like that that is a part of the coffee like this yeah of... well i mean so part of aristotle's definition of accident is that it's in something not as a part <laughs> right so like i mean uh so it's not a part but it's in it somehow yeah i mean well i mean as i'm about to say Locke and the medieval nominalists um, disagree diametrically about which things are real and which are not, right? So to give an example, you have to say according to William of Ockham or according to Locke or, right? So, um, and that's that's one thing that makes it so hard to talk about this because like, obviously to make it understandable, I would have to give lots of examples, but there's no examples that people don't, uh, disagree about, and um, that makes it really confusing. Um, but so, you know, so like in the case of the cup of coffee, um, Locke would, Locke will say that um, heat, sweetness, color, all of those things are um, really mere powers or bare powers of the coffee. So there is no thing in the coffee that is in you know in the way that Locke is going to understand this, which we're going to get to. There is no thing in the coffee that is its uh, heat or sweetness or color, um, but there is a thing in the coffee that is its size, its shape, its solidity. <laughs> right, those are the primary qualities, and those are the real qualities of body. Um, William of Ockham would say almost the opposite. Right? According to him, the only real qualities are certain sensible qualities, basically. I don't know whether he would include heat. Um, Probably would. I don't, I don't know exactly what his list is. I, I don't think it includes everything that you might call a sensible quality, but it, but, but it's basically in that area. So like heat, sweetness, and color would probably be the kind of things he says are real. <laughs> um, whereas anything like size, shape, whatever, um, Occam is a nominalist about those. <laughs> right. So... Um, but like 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 what they're arguing about is something like um you know the of the things that look like not the in the cases where it looks like we're denominating something from its properties not merely from its effects which are in which cases are we right and in which cases are we mistaken and what we're talking about is really a a, a power a bare power, as Locke keeps saying. Right? A bare power is the opposite of a real power. A real power is a power that's based on some real thing in the object. So, um, 
Right. So like, so for example, Locke will say, well, when we talk about the brightness of the sun, what we mean by brightness is really just its ability to like cause me to perceive light or cause, you know, seeing creatures in general to perceive light. Um, and so it's not true that it would be bright, even if everything else went away. It's just like the wax case. Take away the wax, and there is no actual wax meltings left. There's only the potential for it, right? And the same thing is true of the sun. If there's no one to see it, then it's not bright. That is, the brightness isn't anywhere now. Although it still has the power <laughs> to call to right uh, to 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 look bright <laughs> under the right circumstances, um, um, you know the way Occam thinks about it is really different, and I probably especially because I'm running a lot of time here. Ooh, really running out of time. I shouldn't I shouldn't get into trying to explain why Occam what Occam thinks about it, but basically uh, Occam thinks that 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 things that just have to do with the disposition of the parts of the substance to each other are nothing in addition to the substance itself. Um I mean, I said I wouldn't get into it. I won't get into it. All right. <laughs> I can resist. Um because I need to get on to explaining how this is connected with um, what's special about the primary qualities, according to Locke. Right, so Locke div divides the qualities of bodies into two parts, primary and um, secondary. In both cases, a quality is always the power to cause me to perceive a certain idea. That's how he defines quality. So the powers are really in the bodies. So, you know, like in the snowball, there's a power to cause me to perceive a round figure under the right conditions. That power is one of its primary qualities. In the snowball is also, I can't really draw this on a whiteboard, can I? But say white. <laughs> in the pet snowball, there's also a power to cause me to perceive the idea of whiteness under the proper conditions. Um, and uh, that's one of its secondary qualities. So, so far, like, it seems like they're both really in the body, right? What does it mean to remember mechanism says the only properties other are, um, that are really in bodies are those size, shape, bulk, right? The things that Locke calls primary qualities. But so far, it seems like both of these qualities are really in the body. What are you saying they're not really in the body? So um, to explain the difference, Locke says, well, first of all, primary qualities, they're both, these are both powers in the body to cause me to perceive a certain idea. But a primary quality is a real power and a secondary power, quality is a bare power. And he adds, um, Right, so this is real power versus bare power. And this is, he adds that this resembles my idea. And this doesn't.
Now, this is one of those places where uh, people start to suspect that maybe Locke is not that bright. <laughs> so I wish I had more time to talk about it at length. But because on the surface, this seems like nonsense. Like, what do you mean? Like, let's take this case. What do you mean it doesn't resemble my idea? How can you tell that? Well, you know, like, you might think that to check if two things resemble each other, you have to, like, look at them both and compare them. But the only way you can look at something white is by having it cause you to perceive the idea of white, right? So there is no other way to get around behind that idea and see what it really looks like and compare them to see if they resemble each other. Um, so the whole issue of resemblance seems to be completely out of place here. Um, however, I think Locke means something really technical by resemblance. And what he means by resemblance is um, basically what we call isomorphism, or a simple version of it is analogy. So let's say we have two different simple ideas such that one of them makes the other one necessary. Now, when I see it makes the other one necessary, I mean, you have to be somewhat careful what that means. It doesn't mean you always perceive them together, but when you perceive one, you always can perceive the other or something like that, right? There's a visible necessary connection I mean, between these two ideas, even though they're simple. Now that might seem like it's absurd and that's exactly what, for example, Hume is gonna say about it, that this is absurd. <laughs> But supposing you believe in that, here's the qualities that cause these ideas. If these two ideas are necessarily connected to each other, these two qualities must be necessarily connected to each other. Right? If every time I perceive this one, I can perceive this one, it must mean that every time there's a power to produce this perception, there's a power to produce this, this perception. And remember uh, what Locke said. So if I had time, I would read this, but I'm almost out of time. So, uh, but um, in book four, he's going to say this in a more general way, but we already had an example of this kind of necessary connection between different ideas, right? When Locke said, uh, the quality of solidity is caused by the power to keep my two hands apart. Or sorry, the idea of solidity is caused by the power to keep my two hands apart, right? What that means is that whenever I have the idea of solidity, I know I can also, in this case, it's not simple, but I can also have the complicated idea that consists of like seeing them or feeling that my two hands aren't getting closer to each other. <laughs> And in, in book four, when he talks about this, he gives much simpler examples. And the one of the examples he gives is the connection between solidity and impulse. I mean, I guess what I just said is really an example of the connection between solidity and impulse. The necessary connection between solidity and impulse. Whatever gives me this idea, I know is capable of pushing other bodies out of its way. And vice versa. So this means that, and what, what Locke says in book four is that this only happens with primary qualities. Now, I mean, he doesn't say that all the way back here, although he gives examples, as I said, when he talks about solidity. Um, but I think, um, you know, I'm going a little bit out on the limb here because he doesn't say this explicitly, but I think that's why they're primary qualities. 
their primary qualities because they have a visible necessary connection to other primary qualities. And because of that, so now I think he's kind of reinterpreting what it means for the power to be real. It's not so much whether it's a separate thing. That never made that much sense anyway. Like you can't take that thing out or whatever. But the question is whether it's a subject of predication, whether we know something about it. In the case of um, the quality of whiteness, the only thing we know about it is it causes us to perceive white. That's its definition, right? So that doesn't, that's no, there's no substantive knowledge there. All I know is that the whatever causes me to perceive white causes me to perceive white, <laughs> right? So this quality of whiteness is not a thing I can make propositions about in the external object. But this quality of solidity is, and it's because of this analogy, right? So even though um, all I know about these two powers um, it might seem like all I know about these two powers is that they cause these two ideas in me. Actually, I know one more thing. I know that they're related to each other the way the ideas are related to each other. So I know that my ideas represent a real a structure in the in the external object. And that's what it means to say that in this case, my idea resembles, the object, right? Not that if you could look at these qualities without using ideas, they would look the same as these ideas or something like that. But that as these ideas are to each other, these powers are to each other. That's resemblance. And uh, obviously I should say a lot more about that, but I'm out of time. Um, and I'm gonna have to, uh, We'll have to figure out what to do next time. But until then, <laughs> I'll see you later. Bye.